In the decade following the September 11th attacks, the United States began a program of mass deportation. Estimates are between four to six million deported. Those hit hardest were Latinos, primarily Mexicans, who make up 97% of those deported. Rejected by America, rejected by Mexico, they struggle to survive along the border. sort of a closed community of deportees, homeless, drug addicts, and sex workers. This is where most end up. Pues, pero en casa hace un recorrido eh, por semana. Entramos diariamente a la canalización dentro de diferentes compuertas que se le llama. Este es, digamos, de la compuerta 1 a la 9 y este es lo que es la, el área del bordo donde está la, el cruce internacional, donde está la línea fronteriza. Tratamos de entrar una vez por semana para hacer la prevención con, los, con las personas usuarias y deportadas y ver las necesidades que tienen. People essentially get trapped here. Yeah, they, they get, get trapped and they get stuck here in a very difficult situation without any money, no ID, can't go home, they can't go back to the cities where they come from. We, we hear it all the time. The person that, that was born in, in Mexico, then he was taken to the States when he was very, very young. So he doesn't know anything about, about Tijuana or Mexico or the cult culture. So they come here and they're, bas they're basically culture shock. They, they don't know what to do. They, some of them don't speak the language. Some of them don't know anybody here. So it's very, very difficult. These people, uh, they, they, they you know, have been living in the United States illegally for 20, 30 years. Their whole family's there, um, but they're Mexican. So they wind up in the revolving door of the system to eventually get deported. And they're brought here, dropped off uh, at the border with no resources. It would be like you and me, you know, if we, we suddenly got deported and dropped off in Tijuana. No money, no resources, no family. The family's over there. They end up lowest of the low. 
El tema de la migración en la frontera es algo con lo que vivimos constantemente en esta ciudad. Conocemos la tragedia de nuestros hermanos migrantes que desgraciadamente tienen que ir a Estados Unidos ya que en, esta, en México no encuentran oportunidades laborales suficientes. Ahora vemos el drama de la deportación, la separación de las familias, todos los padres que dejan a sus hijos, todos los esposos que dejan a sus esposas del otro lado de la frontera. El ideal bueno, sería vivir en un mundo, un mundo sin barreras, en un mundo sin muros, sin fronteras que dividan a los seres humanos. Esto bueno, no, no ha sucedido. Most of them are Mexicans. <laughs> you know, they're as American as you or I. I mean, that's the first hurdle for them. They're discriminated against. Uh, they're not considered Mexican. They have a, a name for them. Plastic people. They're not quite American. They're not Mexican. Con ellas vengo a decirte, mi amor a cambio de nada. Dios permita que continúe este programa porque nosotros atendemos a 1,100 y fracción de gentes diariamente dándoles de comer y la desesperación de estos hombres, en la mayoría son hombres, es necesito regresar a mi lugar, ¿no? Y no contando con la economía, con el apoyo económico para regresarse de alguna forma ni de la familia ni de ellos mismos. Hay un fenómeno muy interesante, cuando a ellos los deportan, ellos cruzan la frontera y están en la frontera de Tijuana y son pues, de alguna forma eh, detenidos, se les quita su tarjeta de, de, de deportación, se les quita lo poco lo mucho que traen y al día siguiente los detienen porque no traen documentación de identificación, los detienen y los llevan a la cárcel, en la cárcel les quitan los tenis, los, lo, lo de valor que traigan y quedan en cinco días esas personas se convierten en, 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 en indigentes, ¿no? son eh, personas que han vivido la, el fracaso de, o la experiencia de ir a Estados Unidos buscando el sueño americano y verlo frustrado ¿no? con una deportación y algunos en algunos casos por muchos años de trabajo en Estados Unidos. El sistema de Estados Unidos ahorita está lastimando a mucha de nuestra gente. ¿no? Después de haber trabajado 15, 20, algunos hasta 30 años en Estados Unidos por su color, por, porque simplemente ya a lo mejor rindieron lo que tenían que rendir, los deportan. Y nosotros tenemos una institución que apoya para darles de comer, sobre todo al recién deportado. I'm here today because the time has come for common sense, comprehensive immigration reform. The time is now. Now's the time. Now's the time. The United States is in a time of enormous hysteria about immigration and it has chosen as a collective body to deal with that hysteria and the quote-unquote problem that Americans see with immigration largely through punishment. There's a trend among those, those bodies, those decision makers, to keep increasing the level of punishment that a person without papers should be subject to. When they support a policy like that, just deport them all because they're sucking up our public resources, they think, you know, this is an individual person, they're not attached to anybody, they have no families, they have no friends, they have no communities that they're attached to. And when you imagine that you're deporting that single person, that cutout figure, then there are no other consequences in your mind. On July 4th, 2010, 19-year-old Jonathan Espinosa of Monterey, California, confronted a former high school classmate who had been bullying him since their days in elementary school. I met my husband, Jonathan Espinosa, about six years ago in high school. We went to Monterey High together. I met him again after high school two years ago, and we fell in love from there. Got married in April 2010. He was arrested in July of 2010 for um, a street fight that turned into charges of assault with a deadly weapon and gang enhancements, which was a huge shock for me. He stayed in jail, Monterey County Jail, for about eight months from then on. And pretty much the whole time we were thinking 
that he would either be released or deported. But uh, of course, we were hoping for the most part that he would just kind of be released, considering the fact that he had been in the country for about 15 years. I was trying to scare this guy off, so I pulled out our knife. It wasn't much of a big knife, it was just a small little pocket knife. I pulled it out, and so he, he starts running, and he, and, he falls, and he trips over. So I just kicked him and punched him and ran away. And then I get caught by the police. It was not, nothing big. I pulled out the knife, but I never used it. You know, I didn't even know why I did it. I just, like I said, I probably was trying to scare the guy off, try to show him that I was the big guy. And got arrested and they charged me with assault with a daily weapon. And I'm wondering how do I get assault with a daily weapon when that guy never got assaulted with it. For Johnny Espinoza, he was charged with assault with a deadly weapon. Assault isn't actually contact, it's the threat of contact. Battery is where actual contact is made. So now, they, they, they wanted to register me as a gang member and everything. And it's horrible, you know, it's, just because you're Hispanic or anything doesn't mean you're a gang member or just because you got in a street fight or anything, everybody gets in fights. In this case, Johnny Espinoza was not a gang member. The assault with a deadly weapon charge was enhanced with a gang enhancement, as was street terrorism, which is uh, issuing threats on a public street of some kind. So the gang enhancements become an incredibly powerful tool, which are disproportionately being applied to people of color and minorities. Irregardless of their actual involvement with gangs, what they're doing is taking people that may have a initial and what could be their only brush with law enforcement and turning them into lifetime criminals, turning them into felons, giving, building up enough strikes that they're receiving lifetime sentences, and in the case of people that aren't American citizens, lifetime deportation. So meaning that, that to, from, from right now, I would never be able to go back to the United States. There's recent legislation and it's been termed secure communities, which is an immigration policy that has mandatory reporting of individuals that would be eligible for deportation. Once Johnny gets booked into custody, ICE is notified, Immigrations and Custom Enforcement. ICE used to be the Immigration and Naturalization Services. After September 11th, when the Department of Homeland Security was developed, Immigration and Naturalization Services were moved into Homeland Security and renamed Immigration and Customs Enforcement. That really reflects the fact that as a matter of policy, we now attach immigration to terrorism. So now we treat all immigrants as potential terrorists. Things like routine traffic stops, even where no ticket is issued, they're still running the person's name, which is hitting the national databases and can result in deportation as well. It's not coming to a lawyer, it's not coming to a judge. It's essentially as if a, an employee at the DMV were determining whether or not you could be excluded from the country that you grew up in and from the woman that you married based on a single day in your life. Ice is a word that is actually meant to make your blood run cold. You know, if you are an immigrant, you are meant to be afraid of ICE. When they get deported, they basically, the deportees, they get thrown into Mexico and just figure it out, do, do what you can to survive. They stay here without ID, without jobs, so they, they have to do something. So a lot of them start living on the streets, and that's where a lot of them get hooked on drugs. And once they're 
hooked, it's very difficult to get it out, especially when they don't have the support of their families or friends or anything. Art demands a certain amount of risk, whether it's emotional risk, being able to go up to someone with a camera and stick it in their face. It takes a certain amount of courage to do that. Or actually putting yourself in sketchy situations. I'm a sucker for adventure. I like the dark areas of cities. I like chaos. I think there's a certain richness that you don't find anywhere else in Tijuana. I hung out in Zona Norte because I was attracted visually as a photographer to the area. The faces, the characters, made for sort of a, a visual treasure trove, you know, for a photographer. What I do basically almost daily here in town is I really, really feel a kinship with the really down and out addicts downtown. And I don't know, I, I like to go down and document them with my, my camera, you know, and, and, and get their story out there. And somehow I hope, you know, I'd really like to, to help even one or two of these people. It would be a coup for me, you know. It, it's really heartbreaking to see uh, what's going on. I was struck by the open using of drugs on the Meridian, on, on, on Via Rapida. There's a strategy behind that. The traffic moves so quickly, and there's so much of it. They can see cops coming, and the cops aren't able to stop fast enough to do anything about it, which gives them that wind of opportunity to do what they have to do. I wanted to go out on the Meridian and take, take shots of people shooting up there. I saw these two guys, Weto and Dragon, they were walking across the street, and I asked them, I said, hey, what are you guys doing? You guys you know, want to make a little money? If you do, would you allow me to take some, some photographs of you uh, doing what you do out there? And they were, you know, more than happy to oblige. So we went out, we did a shooting, and they invited me into their little home and started from there. My name is uh, Javier Godinez Mondragon. I go by the nickname of Dragon. This is my, my friend named Joel. They call him Güero. And we both stay in this place uh, for the last two years. I went to the States when I was uh, 13 years old and I lived there till, till I was about 29 years old. And the reason why I didn't become a citizen it was because uh, paperwork and stuff. You know, I, I should have been citizen, I guess, in my teens, but, you know, because of paperwork, it took so long, and always, always, they always putting it, putting it away for another date, it, it became the, I guess, too late. By the time that it, I, I was to become a citizen, I had already committed a crime. Um, it was, I had a small case of dope. It was uh, marijuana, and I ended up being deported. After I got out of prison, my, I, I left my wife, my two kids, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, everybody. I, my entire family lives in the States. I have no one here in Mexico. Okay, this is what I call home. This is the place that I stay at, and it's not very much, but this is where, I, this is where I've been staying for the last couple of years. Very, very sad place. I don't have very much. Everything is a big mess. Right now we're lacking electricity. We're, we're about to go get uh, some electricity right now, but there's three of us that staying in this place right now. And, you know, some of us are, are, have been using drugs, honestly, and, and you know, we're just, trying to, we're just trying to survive right now. They're uh, focusing on cleaning up that part of, of Tijuana. A chief of police gave an ultimatum. Either they get out of there, find new places to go, or they will be dealt with 
by brutal force. <laughs> this is this one of our, one of the guys. This guy lives lives right there, man. He just lives right on the sidewalk. I've known him for about I say about four since I've been here, close to two years. And ever since I seen him, he lives right there. And I never even knew that he was deported too. I just asked him, you know, today. He goes, yeah, and I lived there for 10 years. Why is everybody crossing the street? Because they have to. Because the police uh, oh, yeah. be running after us. So what we have to do, we have to get around them. And as you can see, you know, either they come from the top or they come from the bottom, you have to make a run for it. And actually, you know, sometimes they come from both ways and you just run each in, you know, every other direction. And, and you know, people get hit. People get hit and sometimes they get killed. He said that three weeks ago, what, they were being chased that um, one of the guys, uh, they were getting surrounded right there, and he, that's where he got hit. And they call him Huero, he got killed right there. Across Via Rapida, down inside the canal, is where the Deporti Shanti town is located. Every day, hundreds of deportees race across the Rapida to avoid police raids and escape to the safety of the sewers. And sometimes, the police are watching and waiting. <laughs> He's leaving. This guy, this guy right now, that's the only reason why they didn't, they didn't run right now because the cops were, saw the camera. Yeah. I've, I've seen about at least five people died on, on this on this sidewalk right here. There used to be crosses here, there, down there, and there's another one right there. The, the, the cops over here, they're, they're, they're a handful. Right now, right now we should take a walk because there's a, the truck is up there. Come on. So they wind up in this dry riverbed. You go down there, there's hundreds of people living down there, and their life expectancy is not long. The scene down there is something like out of uh, Dante's Inferno. one guy that was held up by his feet and was dropped all the way down. Of course, he never, he never made it out of here alive. And that's what some of his, some of his cops use this to get rid of people. The ditch that we're looking at is some of the area that used to be all populated by hundreds of people. There used to be lots of houses and even houses underground because they used to be all full of dirt on top of, the, of all this concrete. And as you can see, everybody has been moved away. They're just walking around and wondering, but in the night times, you see the, all these bridges underneath and in the holes, they, they go in to, to stay warm, to stay away from the cold.
these are our homes for people, you know. At nighttime, it's full of people. Everybody's out right now trying to make, you know, trying to make ends meet. But as you can see, it's, just, it's just the sewer. And this is where people live right now. Since I was nine, in the United States, I went to school out there, grammar school, high school. And now I'm facing here in Mexico, I ain't got no family out here. And uh, the government here doesn't help us at all. If I to go back to the United States, what do I face? I face five years, federal time. So, I don't know, man. Uh, they should do something for us. Just give us a hand to get a job. Because you get a job here, and all they want to pay is $5. That's not life. Sometimes this is the way we're living now in the river. Nobody, nobody cares for us. My name is Carlos Gomez. He, he was just recently deported. He just com completed a five-year term for re-entry. And now he finds himself living in this gutter right now. Perdí mi familia, perdí todo, y ando viviendo aquí como un perro ahora. He said he lost his family, and now he's living like a dog over here. Like shit, like shit. Me es bien dura esta vida para mí porque yo estoy yo estoy creado en el otro lado, ¿verdad? Pero he said his life is way too too hard for him because y nos deportan como un raised in the states. Y nos nos deportan como un perro. Tenemos hijos y todo allá y no les importa el gobierno. He said when they deport you, they don't they don't give a shit if you have kids, if you have family over there. They don't care. They just ya veo eso. Ship you out like a dog. Yeah, yo quiero ver a mis hijos y todo y no puedo. He's been trying to see his kids ever since, and he hasn't been able to. Fucking cry every night when I dream about my kids. There's nothing I can do. I didn't start getting high till I was like 30 years old. And I mean, it seems like my, my life really started going downhill after I was deported. But believe it or not, I used to get high just off of life, off of playing baseball, just doing things with my family. And, and 30 years old, I find myself, you know, in a new country where I don't know anybody, no family. You know, all I see is what what is around me. I mean, I mean, there was nothing good around me. And that's when I started using drugs. And, and, and I really want to get out of this life. And I, I'm just, I just hope that there is a, there's a way that I can, I can find help for, for myself and for others like me. But, uh, Between the two cities lies 10 square miles of unpopulated security zone, patrolled by Homeland Security on land, sea, and air, 24 hours a day. It is virtually impossible to cross. They are continually harassed by the cops. The cops 
regularly come by, arrest them, put them in these horrible jails for, 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 for 24 hours and burn their belongings. This is The Spot. Operated by the Tijuana Cartel, this 24-hour drug market is the most dangerous location in the entire city. Located two blocks from Dragon's home. As you want to see the whole thing. See something seem to ha happen over here. I don't know if it was an accident or somebody getting run over. But the police and the fire department showed up. They started raiding the place, and the and the guy started, started tried to run away from him. As the cops were coming, he tried to beat him to jump the fence to the other side. Because once you jump the fence to the other side, they can't mess with you. You're in the United States. You know what I mean, that's what he was trying to do, and the car smacked him, killed him. What? Just a car. No, the, no, the, the cop, truck. The truck, the, the cop, 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 the police, the cop truck, yeah. The police hit them. The police. That's why they were trying. Yeah, they're, they're, trying, they're telling me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why they were trying to. They wanted to fucking take my Yeah, hand. I did something like that. There's a cop on top of the water already. There's there's always a policeman up there patrolling. But yeah. see, that's that happens every... Does that happen right now? That's like all the time. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing now, you know. People do just to survive, you know. You know? I got addicted here. Is it? Yeah. I got addicted here. I wasn't really you sure. You get addicted a lot of times because of the situation. You, I mean, you're so lonely. You, you have no family that is gonna, like, the know, easy way out. Drugs. That's gonna look at. That's gonna look at you, or, or that you're gonna feel like, oh, you know, I don't want them to see me like this. So you end up doing doing it the first time to, to like try to, you know, to forget, forget about where you're at and, and all that. And before you know it, you. You're addicted to dope, you know. Of course, drugs aren't the only problem that they have. Not all of them are addicted. Not all of them have a drug problem. But believe me, if you're dropped off in the chaos of downtown Tijuana, you've been traumatized by leaving everything and everybody you know, eventually winding up in a sewer drain. If you don't have a drug problem, you will have a drug problem. Why not? I got deported. I've been out here for seven, almost eight years. Um, it's been hard out here. It's I'm not used to it because I've uh, all my life I lived on the other side. So, but it's really bad out here. The cops treat us really bad. Um, it's like Hitler days to me, you know, because we can't be walking around the streets because they pick us up for no reason, and, and, and like we're not used to it, you know. At least, well, at least on my part, I'm not, you know. Um, I've seen a lot of ugly things, you know, as far as the police, you know, beating up, you know, my friends or actually killing, you know, certain people that I know. Recently, um, one of my friend's um, boyfriend, he got thrown off of a truck, police truck, going to the jail, you know. And his girl, as a matter of fact, uh, they know her, you know. Um, she was okay, but then she, she, you know, after that happened, you know, she just started going, she started losing it, you know, and... and because of the treatment that we have here and her also being deported and her also having to deal with life here, you know? I mean, the jobs are bad and it's just really hard, you know? And um, yeah, they, they, they killed him or they say he jumped off, but I'm not, you know, I don't know if it's true. I do different things. I go to the line to clean cars. I, um, I sell clothes, I clean uh, houses. I help ladies out, you know, babysitting. Um, different things that come up, you know, I sweep yards, um, clean yards, whatever, you know, and 
just walk around and see what I could do because the jobs out here, for starters, we gotta have all kinds of, you know, credentials and, and, and we gotta look a certain way and it's just like, you know, it's hard. And they pay you like, what, $10 a day? Not even $10, like $8 a day, you know? Once a week, an American religious charity offers a free bowl of beans in exchange for a sermon. I am living not a fruitless life. Yo personalmente digo que no vivo una una vida sin fruto bueno. I have a future in Christ. Yo tengo un futuro con Cristo. The point is. Pero el punto es. I was starving too, thank God. I was starving, man. I was. I was starving, no? I hadn't eaten in days. And I can't, I can't sell nothing. I've been trying to sell clothes and I can't. Nobody wants to buy nothing. I went sweeping. Okay, nobody wanted me to sweep their front, you know, their, their business. Nothing. I was like, fuck. Oh. I hadn't eaten in three days. I swear to God, three days. Here, stand next to one another. Okay. All right, Joe Obama. <coughs> uh, he deported me after being for 40 years in America. Yeah, it really hurts. To me, being in America, like I was raised in America, it really hurt me real bad not to be able to go back. You got Mexico, mijo. You sat me before, sat me deported, man, but that's what we learned, man. For all the others over there, keep your hands straight, keep yourself out of trouble. That's it. I'm out. Thank you. What was the incident that got you deported? Uh, a traffic ticket. Uh, a, a delayed traffic ticket. They took me in, and then all of a sudden everything came to, came to its head. And have you deported for that? Well, my, my name is Sergio Antonio Armendariz Diaz. My, this is my mother, Elena Diaz. Uh, I just got deported. Um, they sold the car to me, and uh, it was stolen. So that that got stopped on the freeway on the 78 going to Oceanside. So I went to jail and I got deported. You no, know, before that, um, they went to the house. And they, they were had a search warrant, so they took me in. And then the INS was there too with the with the cops. Maybe they said it was a Hispanic. They, some you know they were looking for Hispanic, so I don't know why the INS showed up too. <clears throat> so um, they asked for my mom's papers, and she didn't have some. So they took her. They asked for my grandparents' papers, and uh, they had it, so they stayed. And so I got. Went to jail. They found out it was, it was, I bought a stolen car. I didn't steal it, and um, so I got deported. And they deported my mom, and she was on the process. ¿De qué? ¿De proceso de qué? Ah, uh, dile que ya me habían dado el seguro social y que me habían dado un permiso para trabajar y un permiso para estar allá. Pero migración dijo que que a mí me faltaban tres años para que me dieran para que me dieran eh, La mica y que por eso me deportaron. Historically, we have never really made it possible for Mexicans to immigrate easily with papers. For Mexicans to get in, you know, the line, like people always say, you should get in line like everybody else, there's no line for Mexicans. So this cycle of migrating without papers, getting deported, migrating more, getting deported again, that cycle for Mexicans has existed since big chunks of Mexico became the United States. This was Jonathan Espinoza's mother days after her son was deported. She's also undocumented and could not reveal her identity without being deported. If she were to be deported, she would join the estimated 200,000 or more parents who have been deported by secure communities. Her 10-year-old daughter would become a ward of the state. If she attempts to return to Mexico to visit Jonathan, she will never be allowed back in the United States again. Yo llegué aquí en el 97 o 96 y me traje a mi hijo por un futuro mejor. Él tenía cinco años. Llegó luego lejito estudiando el primer año. Salió la primaria. Me 
estudió la secundaria también. Let's say you had a treatment tomorrow. You wouldn't leave Wero. You guys are a team. I really, I really don't want to leave him behind because you know he's been, you know, such a good friend to me. You know, and even though to the up and downs, you know, and he's he's never left my side, and you know we've always shared whatever little bit that we had, and and I, you know, I think it would be unfair for me just to to disappear on him, you know, and not leave him, a, not give him a, a fighting chance either. But I think that if I have to do what I have to do, you know, before, first in order to help him, I have to help myself, you know. Es como nos bañamos aquí en, en el en el ghetto, más o menos. <laughs> sí, no, qué loco. Eso como vivimos, carnal. Así es, carnal. Chatos, pero le pegamos el shower. The cops here in, in Tijuana have quotas. They have a certain amount of, of people that they have to arrest per day, and they do it any way possible. Some of them uh, just stick a knife in the guy's pocket or stick some drugs in the guy's pocket and they, they take him off to jail. Possible raid on the uh, dope house down there on the sidewalks of the wall. You seen the, the last one with the blue with the blue shirt? Come on, let's go. They saw me. Yes. The 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 cop that that was the the that ran the last one, the one with the light blue uh, shirt. He's the one that beat the shit out of me the last time when when I got caught over here. Him and all his buddies, they they took me to the, to the station and and put me in a cell and they had me on my knees handcuffed my hand on the back and there they started taking turns just beating the shit out of me I had to get stitches on my my eyebrow and I mean they I had lumps all over you know my elbows were all dislocated and shit I mean they they really put it on me
¿Qué es, jefe? ¿Qué anda haciendo? Nada. Tengo que preguntarle porque aquí soy su director. No, oh, no, no, no sé. ¿De nada. qué se trata? No, de nada, jefe. Está sacando Estaba, estaba esperando a mi amigo que va a saber que, que salga para. Lo, lo quiero tomar una foto el güey. ¿A qué te dedicas? Mm, trabajo ahí en la, en la, por la línea. Estoy comentando la rampa, no sé. Ahí va a rana mi amigo. ¿No vas a hacer mal uso de.? No, no, jefe, no, de seguro que no. My name is Chris Dora Duque. I was addicted to heroin for 10 years. I moved to San Diego uh, in 2005. Met up with a friend who said that uh, in Tijuana they had cheaper drugs. Uh, uh, cops one day raided me. I was coming out buying like 25, 20 nickels of heroin, all bundled up separately. And they arrested me, beat the crap out of me, took me in for sales. Um, ended up spending three months in Tijuana prison. Well, in the penitentiary, there's five buildings with three levels, about 20 cells per, per level on either side. I made to house six people, there were six bunkers, and I was in the cell with 31, 32, sometimes at most. I was there for the riots, and the reason that they rioted was we just got a week straight where it was just nothing but rotten food, and uh, people just got fed up with it. And one cell broke out of their cell and um, attacked the guard and took his keys and opened up the next cells and the next cells, and before they knew it, the whole prison was out. Um, the madness, uh, and you're talking 3,000 people, pretty much, give or take. And just running around freely, like throwing guards from the guard towers, lighting shit on fire, um, trying to escape, opening up the women's cell and raping the women. Like, just like absolute madness. Helicopters up above shooting down at um, like the large plaza area in the middle. In 2008, two years into the US funded Mexican drug war, thousands riot in Tijuana's dangerously overcrowded prison. Chaos erupted again Wednesday, both inside and outside Tijuana's notorious state penitentiary, as prisoners began to riot while family members in the streets rampage against authorities. At least 14 people were wounded as federal officers brought order to Baja California's most overcrowded prison with more than 8,000 inmates. Since Sunday's initial riot, thousands of the inmates' family members have been stationed outside the prison, demanding to know the fate of their loved ones inside. At least four prisoners were killed in that incident. They don't feed you, they don't give you toilet paper, there's no water, but uh, the dope runs free. It's cheap, I guess, for the, the, the police and the guards to turn a blind eye. It's cheaper than food, it's cheaper than everything else. It makes sense, you know, just keep them sedated. Um, I was in a cell with, like I said, 30. About 20 of them were heroin addicts. And all sharing one needle. Dragon, tell us what's happening. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it's the same the same uh, um, cop that was earlier this morning. And, I, and they might be looking to see if, if they can see anybody with the camera over there, because they're right in front of my house. Some walking out, walking out with the machine guns.
Right now they're doing the operativo right now. They just started. They're chasing people around, everybody just went down the canal. There's a guy, there's a guy that just came out of there. the fence over there. They got the They got the whole group that is walking down over there. This, this truck right now just stopped right now and just pulled two guys right next to me. He tried to get me right now too. I think he's waiting for me to come out, but I ain't coming out. All the places where I used to live. So close, but yet so far. This is actually one of the places where people come to spend nights because the police don't come over here and pick you up during the night. They can actually have a, uh, a night's you know, worth of sleep. During the night, the police raid the canal. Twelve deportees were killed when police bulldozed their shacks and set fire to their remains. There were about 20 guys and this is all that was left after the raid last night. We're gonna actually go inside one of these alcantarillas, what they call. See what's happening inside. Found one of them open. Hey, fellas. What's happening? Yeah. Hey. Damn. Hey. 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 As you can see, they have all sorts of things in here. They're doing a little cleaning right now. They're brushing the walls. Simon. Trying to keep the place real clean. And what it says is that the police uh, raided him last night and, and burned all their blankets down. So it's a, it's a never ending thing. They start over and over every time. 
This yellow line right here is the one that divides the two borders. You know, at this point, I'm in Mexico, and I can make one step to the left and actually cross to the United States. We're standing right next to the fence, I'm about to look to this little gate. Border Patrol agent. You can see all of the states. I don't know if he's gonna be too happy about me videotaping this, but. another dead body this morning and uh, decided to go take some footage of it and while I was taking the footage the one of the one one of the guys was kicking the body you know to flip him over and stuff and the other one was grabbing him by the hair picking his face up so they could take pictures of it and I guess they saw me when I was taking the, the, the pictures or, or the film and he pointed at me and so I started I started just like walking away at first and then then when I saw him he started chasing so I go into Doña Mari's I run inside and I'm almost making it to the back when one of the cops pointed me with the with the machine gun and told me to fucking stop or he was gonna shoot me and then I stopped I told him okay 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 you know by then I got I, I got the camera and I, I threw it inside one of the plants while he was asking was where's the fuck is the camera where's the camera and I told him, I said, well, what are you talking about? I have no camera. He goes, don't fucking act stupid. Boom, boom, he started fucking hitting me. Fucking, you know, next thing you know, they, they got me handcuffed and they start fucking hitting me more. And, you know, as they're tossing me around, they fucking, they push me into the plant, the plant falls over and the fucking camera just like, you know, falls over. Oh yeah, so you didn't, you, were, you don't know what, what the fuck we're talking about, huh? He was in his boxer shorts. He's dressed differently now and, uh, like, you know, his cuts on, the, on his legs where they beat him. His legs, he was limping, he could hardly walk. Why did they let him out? We paid. How much? Uh, what was it, 43 bucks for, uh, the charge was being a bother. Public, public bother. You said when you got to the jail, they said, oh, that's him, and, yeah. you know, that's the guy. Do you think they know about what we've been up to at no, this they, point? No, they don't, they don't know, they don't know, but um, like I said, uh, I mean, there's been at least another, another, um, another truck or maybe two cars of police, you know, cars that have seen themselves getting, you know, filmed, but they don't know what's going on, you know. morning, yes. I just heard my name. Threw all my stuff up. After a year in jail, I still got, still got deported. I knew that they were gonna just drop Jonathan, Zoe's husband, off in Tijuana. And I knew that Chris and Kat both lived in Tijuana. And so I I didn't know their phone numbers or anything. I just got onto Facebook. Chris, Chris, please call me. It's an emergency. I need to talk to you right now. My son-in-law is on an immigration bus headed for Tijuana. Could you uh, try to find him? I told her, you know, it would be like looking for a needle in a haystack down there. I was in shackles for the whole day. Since 9 o'clock in the morning all the way to the I got dropped off over here in, in Tijuana. Oh, it was more, more than 14 hours. Crossed into the States. I asked the border patrol there what, what time, you know, if there was a bus coming in, we have a, a friend who might be on it, deported. And they said, well, we can't tell you that. We sort of uh, gave up on the idea and just decided to walk back across into Mexico. And as we were walking across, we noticed a prisoner bus parked outside the custom house. 
No, <laughs> it couldn't be. <laughs> but maybe. Chris and Kat called us. I think it must have been like 11 o'clock at night and said, we got him. And I watched my daughter just completely like melt. She had been tense, couldn't breathe. She was such a nervous wreck. Jonathan probably wouldn't be very safe if they hadn't found him. I haven't stepped in Mexico for 15 years. I don't even feel like I'm from anywhere, you know? I just feel like I'm just a person. I don't really don't feel I have a home. It was really intense because we hadn't actually really seen each other in almost a year. So for the first time being able to see each other in Tijuana was like really emotional. I haven't hugged anybody, I haven't been with anybody for about eight months. And finally being with the person I love the most and seeing him once again is just the best thing. It was so good. What's the first thing you guys did when you got down here, when, when you got back together? Um... We went and sat down on the couch. <laughs> yeah, we stayed on the couch for... Hours. Well, four or five hours just talking. <laughs> yeah, it was... We had a lot to yeah. catch up on. Did he seem different to you? Yeah, well, his hair grew about <laughs> six, seven inches since I last saw him. So that was new, but uh, for the most part, he didn't seem that different to me. He's still the same person. How about, how about Zoe? She was, she was amazing, <laughs> you know? Do I look the same she, too? She looks the same, she's like a same hard worker, a good, strong lady, woman, I'll say. Same person I fell in love with since day one. <laughs> I had planned on working at like a spa, possibly opening one up. We had planned on buying a house having home cars, having a family, doing everything we could to make good life there without having to worry about struggling. And pretty much as soon as he got arrested, that all started to change just because, um, of course, we knew that there was a possibility of him getting deported. Never did I actually think it would become a reality. He, he doesn't even speak Spanish that well. So, uh, he did his time for for the for the charge more than he should have for a teenage fight, a year in uh, in jail. Five minutes before he was going to go home to his wife, to his family, out of the blue, the INS shows up, puts him in a bus, and ships him off with a lifetime exclusion. This kid, as far as I'm concerned, was as American as you or I. That's just wrong in my opinion and he's one story out of thousands of stories so this is our room um it's a little very cozy nice place to be um right now it has all of our stuff in it so it might seem a little crowded but it's not that much stuff so it's okay Zora and i we find out that um she's pregnant she's a month a month in already you know we're really, we're really happy no, I'm just can't wait, can't wait to be with the baby. But plans have changed now. Um, she will be going back to California, back to Monterey, since she will be able to have better, better medical attention. It's, it's, it really, it really hurts me that um, she'll be leaving. We've been separated for eight months already, while I did time in county jail, and. Being separated again, it's it's gonna be hard. I want to be there through the pregnancy. I want to be with her. I want to be there for my firstborn child when when it's born. So I want to be there. But I don't think I'm gonna be able to to do that. But it's but it, we're doing it for the best. How are you feeling about it all, Zoe? Well, um. I, I'm really hurt, of course. It's going to be really hard to go through um, eight months through such a huge life change without Johnny by my side to work through everything with me, everything from morning sickness to hormones raging to not have him right there. It's, 
it's gonna be pretty intense, but I mean, uh, we got through the last eight months of being separated, and I think we can do that again. She's a strong, strong lady, strong mom. She's, she's, she'll be able to do it, but it, I wish I could be there for her. I miss her a lot. We brought Dragon to Playas. We tried to keep him out of the temptations down in uh, Zona Norte. So we set him up in a, a little sort of aftercare house here in Playas. The problem I see for these people is not only are they addicted to the drug, they're addicted to the lifestyle. And it's a colorful lifestyle. In the absence of, 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 the, of the drug and the whole lifestyle of addiction, he had nothing to do. He was moping around here, uh, taking out the garbage, cleaning dishes, sweeping, the, doing whatever. Uh, menial chores were, you know, considered therapeutic possibly for him. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I just imagined what was running through his head, you know. So this is all there is. And, and Dragon is a real alpha junkie. I mean, he does very well. And he can live at the river bottom, he can live homeless and still look like, uh, look fresh and look pretty good. I think we felt it necessary to get him out of Dodge, you know, get him out of town. Coincidentally, somebody was here from San Pancho and he, you know, generously offered to uh, take him there, take him to the, to the halfway house they have it there, to a healthy environment. So that's where he is. Right? Following Dragon's lead, Weddell cleaned up, was able with our help to go home to family in Sinaloa. Shady still lives in Zona Norte with her four brothers, all of whom were deported. Elena Diaz must wait five years before she can try to re-enter the country. If she tries before that, she faces five years in federal prison. Sergio Diaz can never re-enter the United States. Shortly after Dragon left Zona Norte, his house was torched. No one knows who did it. couple of years I've been documenting these people. They've been exceedingly generous in uh, allowing me into their life. I've never felt anything but kindness from these people and generosity for, for allowing me into their lives. I would hope that this film 
which show the kind of people they really are. They're just like you and me. Their circumstances are just unfortunate. You know, I've been to the Statue of Liberty and I've read the thing that she's holding and I don't think there's anything about deportation there. You know, give us your poor, give us your, no. It doesn't say, and then we're gonna kick them out. I would like to go back home. I would like people to see the lives, the struggles that we're going through, how, how hurt we are, how hurt our families are, and yes, that we're suffering. Migration is a core human urge, and it is a core human activity. It is what human beings have been doing since we walked the earth. No matter how many fences we put up or how many men with guns we line up along a border, that core human urge is going to trump all of those efforts to keep people out. There are sons and daughters as much as I am, as, in my, as far as I'm concerned. And I think we have a responsibility to treat them with dignity and respect that they don't get over there, they don't get here.